So we are putting down a big buoy that has a microphone on it underwater and it listens for whale sounds. And that is actually um, something that has been working. Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm talking with Bill Keener of the Marine Mammal Center. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hey, nice to be here, Micah. Yeah, great to have you. So to start, where is the Marine Mammal Center and what does it do? The Marine Mammal Center is located just north of San Francisco in California. And we have the largest marine mammal hospital in the world. And so what it does is rescue seals and sea lions up and down the Northern California coast. And we uh, treat them medically. We've got a big veterinary staff. And uh, if they're uh, hungry, we give them lots of food and uh, or other medicine. And we try to get them so that they're healthy again, so they can be all released back into the wild. So that's the main job that the Marine Mammal Center has been doing since 1975. So that's cool. So what animals do you research? So the Marine Mammal Center does a lot of work with seals and sea lions. And those that group is called pinnipeds. But I really, my favorite is to work with whales and dolphins and porpoises. And those are called satan. Um, the Marine Mammal Center, it's, it's very difficult to rescue a whale. It's a, a big, an adult whale has never been really rescued. We can help them say, let's say they get entangled in a rope or something. We can cut the rope and free them and help them that way. Um, but if uh, a whale gets sick or something, it's very difficult. You can't really bring him in the hospital. But so what I do is I go out and look from shore or I go out on boats and study them in the wild. How'd you get interested in whales? I started at the Marine Mammal Center a very long time ago in 1977. And so I first learned about seals and sea lions. And then I started going out on boats um, to look at uh, marine wildlife like um, seals and sea lions on islands uh, offshore in California. And on the way, we'd see whales. And so I got really interested in whales and dolphins and porpoises. And then I started becoming a whale watch naturalist where I would lead people on trips out to um, see whales. And I've led trips in Mexico to breeding lagoons for gray whales. I've led trips into the Amazon to look for uh, river dolphins in the Amazon. So I've been involved in whales, dolphins, and porpoises for a long time. Oh, so can you tell me how whales evolved? Yeah, whales are, are interesting. Um, they apparently evolved from what we would call like a, a cow or some kind of a grazer, a hoofed mammal. And But this is a very long time ago. I'm talking 50 to 60 million years ago, there were land animals and they went back into the sea. So they went, and as they adapted to life in the water, they lost their legs and they ended up being flippers or flukes, that, which is the tail of a dolphin or whale. And they became fully uh, aquatic, meaning they never come to shore. Uh, they never have to even, like for instance, seals will come ashore um, to rest or to give birth. But whales, they're always in the water. So are whales related to manatees? So that's a good question. Um, they're not super closely related to manatees. Manatees are a group of animals called sirenians, and they're fully aquatic as well. Basically, we got pinnipeds, which are the seals and sea lions and, and walruses. And then we've got um, the sirenians, the manatees and dugongs, and they've got flukes, and, and but they're not really like whales. The whales and dolphins are a separate family that went back uh, into the sea. So actually a few different animals over time have gone back to um, make a living in the water, if you will. One of the animals that it might be more closely related to in the distant past are hippopotamuses. Because when you think about a hippopotamus, they spend almost all their time in the water. They'll come out to feed, but most of the time they're in the water. And which whales do you study? 
The two big whales that I study here in uh, Northern California are the gray whale, which migrates up and down our coast, and the humpback whale, uh, which comes to uh, California to feed every summer and fall. So I, I talk about um, urban whales, meaning they are go into a very developed city environment. The San Francisco Bay Area has got uh, seven and a half million people around it. And so these whales are coming into, you in know, in a sense, like neighborhoods. And so Here's just a picture of a pinniped, a little harbor seal baby. This is what we often are rescuing and uh, fixing up and releasing into the wild at the Marine Mammal Center. But really, I spent a lot of time talking about two species of uh, whales, the, the gray whale and the humpback whale. And so we'll talk about both of them. So this is my office view. I spent a lot of time on the hills around the Golden Gate Bridge uh, in San Francisco, because I'm trying to look down with binoculars and try to find whales that are coming in or out of the bay. And um, of course, I also spend time on the Golden Gate Bridge. I go out and it's an incredible wildlife platform because you can look down, it's about 220 feet down to the water, and you can see dolphins and porpoises here. So let's talk about gray whales first. They're pretty big. They're about 45 to 50 feet long when they're adults. And they are known to migrate up and down California. They breed in Mexico and they feed in Alaska. So along that line, we're halfway along in California. So we get to see them coming and going. But what's happened recently is that starting around four years ago in 2019, a whole bunch of gray whales started coming into the bay and staying for weeks at a time, even months at a time. And that's very unusual. We didn't see that. Normally, we might see two or three gray whales a year come into the bay, stay a few hours and leave on their migration. And we're trying to figure out what's going on. One of the things is that maybe it's a migration stopover, like they're trying to rest if they're tired or exhausted on their migration, and maybe they didn't get enough food, so they're really hungry and they're tired. Uh, but another one answer could be that a few of them have figured out how to find food in San Francisco Bay, and they're getting a snack on the way on their migration. So we've had a lot of these gray whales die over the last four years. Their population has gone from about 26,000 to 14,000 in the last five years. So they're on a severe downward population trend, and that really concerns us. So here's a picture uh, taken near the Golden Gate Bridge that a fisherman was out on a beach and he saw this. This is a gray whale rolling on its side, trying to feed in the mud. Now, gray whales are different than uh, a lot most other whales. Most whales feed on krill, little tiny um, shrimp-like creatures in the water or on fish uh, in the water, but gray whales are different. They feed in the bottom muck. They go down and they suck up uh, a bunch of mud from the bottom and there'll be worms and little crustaceans and clams and stuff, little protein, and they'll take that into their mouth. They'll spit out all the water through their baleen plates and keeps all the good stuff that they want, like the worms and stuff, and they'll swallow that. And that's the way they uh, feed primarily. Now, there's not a ton of food for them here. It's not like Alaska where there's a lot of food for gray whales, but there's a little bit. This is a map that with the uh, Marin County, and here's San Francisco, and this is the Golden Gate Bridge right here in the middle. And these whales, the gray whales that we've been sighting over the last few years, they like to stay way into the bay where there's this big, shallow, muddy uh, bottom. And I think it reminds them of being in Alaska where they feed. They like to be well into the bay. And so what we found over the last few years in San Francisco area is that many of the whales are starving. They just aren't getting enough food at their main feeding grounds in Alaska. And so um, they're having trouble doing the multi-thousands of miles of migration. They just don't have enough energy. So that's why they're stopping in San Francisco to, to try to feed. So let's talk about 
humpback whales because they've got some issues too. Humpback whales are even bigger than gray whales. They're about 60 feet long and they have a different story. They breed in Mexico like the gray whale does, but they don't go to Alaska to feed. They come to California to feed and they're feeding not on the bottom, um, but they're feeding on uh, fish. And it, the San Francisco Bay has a real interesting history with whales because right in the bay near San Francisco was the last whaling station in America because they used to hunt whales. They would go out in boats from San Francisco and harpoon whales and bring them back. And here's a humpback whale they're bringing back. And what are they going to do with it? They're going to turn it into pet food. So that's what they were doing with the whales in the 60s, all the way up to about 19... Um, 71 when they closed. And then since then, the whales have rebounded, meaning their population has been coming back because we're not hunting them anymore. So there's more and more humpback whales that are seen off San Francisco like this one. Here's a picture I took inside San Francisco Bay. And they don't mind coming in in this very busy, active urban area and look for um, food. And what are they feeding on? They're feeding on these little bitty fish. And here's a picture I took from the Golden Gate Bridge, looking down on feeding humpback whales, and all these anchovy are jumping out of the water trying to get out of the way. And then one of the things we try to do is track individual whales to see who's coming back each year, what are they doing, uh, how often are they there, and we can individually identify them by looking at the underside of their tail, underside of their fluke, and it has all have unique black and white um, patterns and all of them we can tell apart so we've got 80 different humpback whales have been in san francisco bay over the last few years um, feeding at different times now one of the things i do is i try to watch out for the whales too and because we're concerned about them getting hit by ships so here is uh, i'm on the hill and the golden gate bridge is to my left and i see that little spout of that little puff of steam that's a spout of a whale and this uh, big container ship actually saw this and moved around. So it tried to avoid the whale, which is a good thing. So here's the Benjamin Franklin. And look at this here in front of it is that's the size of a humpback whale. So you can see that even though whales are huge to us, they are very small compared to uh, these container ships. And then remember I showed you a map of where all the uh, gray whales hung out in the bay with the, the orange color dots. The blue color dots are the humpbacks. They like the deep water near the Golden Gate. And that's where there's the least amount of room for ships to maneuver as they come in and out of the Golden Gate. It's only one mile wide there. They don't have a lot of room. So um, one of the things we're trying to do is get ships to slow down. That's one of the uh, first things they can do is the speed limit in the bay has been 15 knots, which is about 16 miles an hour. We want to try to slow them down to about 10 miles an hour. And that gives the whales more time to get out of the way of ships. And it gives the pilots more time to see whales too. The other thing we're doing is we're trying to listen for whales. Whales make sounds underwater and we can listen for them. So we are putting down a big buoy that has a microphone on it underwater a hydrophone, and it listens for whale sounds. And that is actually um, something that has been working. The sounds go up um, to this buoy, which sends a signal to a satellite. And that satellite can then send a signal to the Coast Guard and, and to us, and then we can know uh, when there's whales uh, in the area. So give us some numbers on the humpbacks and where they live. So um, humpbacks live in all the oceans of the world but the, they are separated into different populations. For instance, there's a population that goes to Hawaii each winter to breed, and then they go up to far northern into Alaska to feed. But the whales that I deal with don't go to Hawaii. They go are from Mexico and Central America where they breed, and they come north to California and maybe into Oregon um, where they're feeding on either krill offshore or fish closer inshore, like in the bay. Those animals, there's probably about um, 3,500, but the North Pacific numbers are doing well. 
So when I first started looking at whales in the 1970s, there was probably 2,000 humpback whales in the whole North Pacific, all the way across. And that's because the numbers were down because we were hunting them. We've stopped hunting them. Their population has uh, come back. And now there's 20,000. So that's 10 times as many whales because we've stopped um, hunting them. So I noticed in the images of the whales that they had these little things cling to their jaw. So what are those? So those are barnacles. And so whales, when you think about it, it's just like a ship. Um, they'll get little things attaching to them and will hitch a ride. So those barnacles are special to whales and they'll live their whole lives on a whale and they'll be carried along and they can get food because they stick out little like little feelers and then they grab food from the water that's going by. And the whales don't mind or do they? That's a good question. We can't ask a whale, does it bug them or not? <laughs> but I have seen um, whales scraping sometimes on objects and a barnacle or two might come off. So it's possible that sometimes it bugs them. Isn't that why they jump out of the water and slap down? Uh, breaching is what that's called. It's when a whale uh, leaps out of the water and smacks down hard. Some people think that it could be trying to get rid of these parasites on them. However, I've seen a lot of breaching in my time. And what I've seen is that it might be part of communication. In other words, think about the loudest sound they can make, and it's to do a cannonball, essentially, into the water and make a huge splash. And they could, that sound carries a long way through water. And what I notice is that when it gets windy and there's a lot more surface noise, they seem to be doing this slapping. They, they might slap their pectoral flipper. They slap their tail, their flukes sometimes or sometimes breach completely out of the water and smash into the water. So I think it sometimes, for sure, it has to do with communication and sending a sound out to let uh, other whales know where they are. So how do they live? Do they live in groups or pods? So the whales that we see in our area um, do live in small groups. There, there'll be um, sometimes three or four coming in through the Golden Gate together, but sometimes they can be single too. Um, we see mothers and their calves come in um, too. Um, the babies are usually born only maybe six months earlier, um, and they'll come up through uh, Mexico and Southern California all the way into our waters where, they, where we get to see them. They think the main reason they migrate is because where their food is is in cool water. Cold water is very um, rich in oxygen and nutrients, and there's a lot of life there. So there's a lot of food for them, like their krill, the little shrimp-like creatures, or the fish, the, like the anchovy. But their babies would prefer warm water because they don't want to give birth in really cold water. And But they uh, mate and they breed down there and then they move back north where all the food is. So how many babies does one mother usually make? Pretty much for all cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises, it's just one. It's a lot of work to uh, raise a baby because their food is coming from the mother. And that mother's not eating, remember, because they're down in the tropics. And so the milk is very rich in fat and tries to get that baby to get as big and grow as fast as it can, as quickly as it can. But the mother, since it's not eating, having two babies would just be too much uh, for the mother. What are the biggest threats to whales? The biggest threats to whales are some human-caused um, threats right now. Shipping all across the world is a big problem. The second one, I didn't have really pictures of, but you can imagine it. They can get entangled in fishing gear. And so we see a large number of whales every year will get caught up in nets or in the lines that crab fishermen have little uh, floats at the top of their crab pots. And those lines can get entangled. Humpback whales have those big, long pectoral flippers, big um, four flippers, and they can get easily tangled in those ropes. And that uh, worldwide is having an effect on whales uh, as well. So what's your hypothesis about the gray whales? I think what's happening, we've seen a lot of deaths of gray whales on their migration path. 
And so it looks like they're not getting enough food on their migration. That's something that uh, other scientists are investigating right now. One of the things that we've just been looking at is we found some gray whales just recently, we, and we just submitted a, a paper on this, feeding on fish, which gray whales don't feed on fish. But if a few of them can learn to feed on fish, that's going to bode well for their survival in the future because they might have to do some uh, diet shifting depending on what's going on in the Arctic. So how exactly does it happen that whales get hit by boats so often? Yeah, that's a really good question. But one of the problems is that whales have evolved in an ocean without ships. And they were the biggest things in the ocean for millions of years. And so they're just not used to having anything else that can harm them in the area. One of the things we also notice is that when they're engaged in feeding, they ignore everything else. They are just focused on getting as much calories into them as quickly as possible. Like they might go down 100 feet to get fish. And it's only when they come up for their breasts um, at the surface that they can get hurt. And we often find that these whales are uh, not paying attention. And then there's another factor. Even if a whale wanted to get out of the way of a ship, the ship noise is really tricky. If the ship is coming straight at them, they can't hear the sound as well because the whole ship is blocking, is muffling and muting the sound. So it's a really complicated issue. People have tried things like, let's put some special sounds up front with speakers and stuff, but it just doesn't seem to work. And in fact, they've played certain sounds and it's almost seemed to attract whales more. So we're trying to tweak how the shipping lanes are when they come into port to avoid areas where whales feed. And we also try to slow the ships down. That's the best we can do uh, at the moment until there's maybe a better technology fix. So gray whales are in a bit of trouble and humpbacks are doing well. So what's your prediction for both of these for the next 30 years? Wow, the next 30 years, that's a good question. I think humpbacks are gonna continue to do pretty well. Gray whales, it's really hard to say. I think they are subject to um, what they call boom and bust cycles. I think those cycles uh, gray whales have been uh, dealing with for a very long time for, thousands of years, and they're going to continue to do that. The part that I'm trying to deal with that the Marine Mammal Center is interested in is trying to get them so that humans and whales can coexist with each other in a kind of close-knit environment, like in the bay, where you've got a lot of activity, a lot of shipping and commerce, um, a lot of economic activity that you don't want to stop, but you also want to have whales take advantage of the fact that San Francisco Bay is cleaner than it was before. And that's what's bringing all the fish. And the fish is what's bringing the whales. It's all about the food. Thank you for talking with me today, Bill. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Micah. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians. Bye.